just sending out some messages. Okay. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm hoping that many of you are here with us. Uh, what would be great would be in the chat if you could um, tell us who you are and where you're from, and then we can see that, which would be lovely. Um, I'm going to introduce myself and the panel that we have together here today. So there is myself, I am Aisha Holloway, I'm the Programme Director for the Nursing Now Challenge, and I am, that is funded by Burdett. I'm also Professor of Nursing Studies here at the University of Edinburgh. And it's wonderful, I can see Zipporah has joined us from Kenya. <laughs> Zipporah, lovely to see you, Zippy, and, um, or not see you, but know that you're with us. Um, so everyone else, please pop in the chat where you are and, uh, and who you are. So um, currently this year, I am the supervisor for our two Bardet Fellows, for the MRA Fellows. And the team are joining us here from Edinburgh University. We have Dr. Larry Doy, who is the Programme Director for our Postgraduate Research Programme, which the MRES sits within. We have Rachel Bruce, who is our lead for our development and alumni and manages the relationship with the Burdett Trust for nursing. And um, we also have Giovanni, who is our wonderful Programme um, Administrator and deals with a lot of the queries related to applications. And then we have Gertrude um, Vanda, who you will must pay particular attention to what she says, because she is actually one of the Burdett Fellows. She's currently um, with us in Edinburgh. She's been with us in September. And you'll hear more from Gertrude about her experiences of even thinking about applying for this um, fellowship, the application process, how she has moved from Malawi to Scotland and she's back in Malawi now collecting her data and just her experience and it'll be an opportunity for you to be able to ask her some questions also you can put those in the Q&A box. Um, we're hoping also to have Izzy Riley who is also the second Burdett Fellow and her experience she's a home student you'll know that we have two fellowships one for an international student and one for a home student. Hopefully Izzy's joining us, she's having a little bit of trouble connecting, but we do have a video of her. So first of all, I'm going to kick off. Um, Gertrude is coming from Malawi and I think she's just frozen a little bit, so she will hopefully rejoin us. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Larry Doy, who's going to speak to you a little bit more about the environment within which you will be a student as part of the programme if you were to apply it and be successful. So handing over to Larry and then after him we'll hear from other members of the team. Hopefully this will be extremely helpful for you um, in understanding more about how to apply, what this is all about and obviously we can follow up with you after today's session. Thank you so much for listening. Larry, over to you. Thanks, thanks Aisha. Thanks so much. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Larry Doy. I'm the Postgraduate Research Director in Nursing Studies. So if you join us, I'll be the key contact for you. So I oversee the Master's by Research Program and also our PhD program. And we, we have a very vibrant, uh, we call the uh, Postgraduate Research Community here in Edinburgh. It's, it's a very, so at Every year we have between 30 to 40 postgraduate research students. So we are quite big, which is quite exciting. So you are not going to be by yourself. Although your research is quite unique, you also have a, a, a peers around you, supporting you. We have groups as well. Within nursing studies, we have uh, four research groups. So if you join us as a postgraduate research student, we will expect you to join at least one of these four research groups. So the research groups we have currently are global public health. So irrespective of your topic, if you have interest in global public health, you can still join this group. Okay. But usually we, we, we believe that your research, the research that you would like to do, will align with one of these research groupings within uh, nursing studies. 
So as I said, we have global public health. We have sudden interruption in health. So kind of ICU, if you are interested in ICU stuff, then that will be a research group that you could join. Then we also have marginalization and health. So anything, homelessness, any asylum seekers, any research interest in that area, you could also join that group. Then we also have policy and health professionals, uh, research groups, research group that Aisha is leading. So they are interested very much in policy related uh, research. So if you're interested in changing, influencing policy, you are interested in research that will change practice, then that research group will be the one that you would like to, you would like to be involved in. The good thing about our, about our research groups is that it's not only students, it's both students and staff. So both students and staff part of this, uh, joining this group, so it's very vibrant. And you may, you may not end up, it's, okay, you may do something. The research group, depending on the agenda or what they are working on, you could then be involved in doing a research project, which is even beyond your actual master's by research study or the, your research project that you're working on. And now, for my group, for example, the Global Public Health Research Group, we are working on doing a systematic review together. So if you are within that group and you're interested in the topic that is being the research, uh, systematic review research that is being done, you can decide to join it. But of course, we are conscious that your, your main goal is to do your master's get your master's by research degree so your involvement in this research group is will be very minimal so you you get a chance to be involved but your main priority will be your own research group and also within edinburgh university we have research courses as well so if you come aside from your normal uh, courses that you would do within the within nursing studies they are also courses from the Institute of Academic Development. So we have uh, the institute here that are keen to help research students to develop. So if you see any course that you want, for example, if there is a course on time management and you're interested in that, you want to do that course, you can register and take that course. So it's a very vibrant research community and also training opportunities are available for you to, to be part of. So, yeah, I will leave it here, but hopefully after you've heard from everyone and you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer those questions. Thank you very much, Aisha. Back to you. Lovely, Larry. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive and succinct um, insight into our community here in nursing studies. At the University of Edinburgh. We are a very small um, subject area within the university, but we have a global reputation for research and we are the number one um, nursing school in the UK. I think we've been doing that for, for many years. Um, and because we're a small team, that means we are like a, a small community and family. Um, so we're heading over now to hear from Rachel and Giovanni. Um, a little bit more about the relationship with the Burdett Trust for Nursing and Giovanni around the actual application process. So um, over to you, Rachel and Giovanni. Lovely, thank you, Aisha. I'm um, so really pleased to welcome everyone today and hope we can share information across this fantastic partnership that we have with the Burdett Trust for Nursing. Um, so the University of Edinburgh and the Burdett Trust for Nursing have quite an established relationship now. And for those that maybe aren't aware, um, and we can share further information on um, the trust itself. Um, but the trust has been in its current form since around 2002. Um, and it's really to promote, advocate, support and raise awareness and the voice and the um, really the capacity of nursing globally um, right across all areas. Um, so we've been really, really pleased to work with them uh, for a number of years now. And last year, um, in honour of their and in recognition of their 20th anniversary, the Trust decided to start the Burdett Fellows Network. 
and we were absolutely honoured that we were one of the higher education institutions um, that they selected to launch the programme with. So it was launched at Edinburgh and also at King's College London. Um, so we were really pleased to be part of that. And as Aisha said, um, the university is very proud of our, our work and our students with nursing and what we are able to produce both in terms of research um, and that the local, national, international impact that has, um, but then just the, the calibre of our students that are coming back, back out of nursing and then that we're wanting to bring back in um, for further um, development of their, their studies and their work and their practice and profession. Um, so whenever we were able to establish the Burdett Fellows, um, this was an opportunity really to look at the, the research capacity in nursing and what can we do to elevate that. Um, so that is the main premise of uh, the opportunity with the scholarship. And we were delighted that last year we were able to recruit. We had our very successful year one, and you'll hear shortly from Gertrude. Um, but with the partnership and what the scholarship offers um, is the opportunity to have your full fees covered and a significant contribution to a stipend as well. Um, and this is all through fantastic funding from the Burdett Trust, which we're absolutely delighted to have um, recognized it's such a significant opportunity. And each year, this is awarded each year annually, as Aisha had touched on as well, to one overseas international student and one UK domicile student. Um, so a brilliant opportunity to bring two people together to go through the experience as well. And I think Gertrude and Izzy will be able to talk to that um, today too and just the, the added support and benefit of that. Um, the partnership we aim to have running for a minimum of five years and we do hope that we can extend that. Um, but in the first um, phase, our priority for our overseas um, students is at the minute um, Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, we are open to international students right across, um, but just uh, the approach for the first initial phase of the fellows here at Edinburgh um, will be on Africa. And I know uh, Gertrude will be able to speak to a very personal experience from that as well. Um, so I think that has sort of covered the background of the, the relationship and we're keen that your your experience, if you come in and choose to are able to study with us, it's very much you are part of the community of Edinburgh. You will become part of our alumni community, but we're also building with working with the trust, a really strong network for the Burdett Fellows. So there will be multiple opportunities um, to engage with uh, previous year one students, then looking at cohorts across year two and really maximizing the opportunity with across our networks at Edinburgh as well. And especially with Larry and Aisha, I think fantastic networks will be able to open up. Um, so really keen that we can attract as many as possible. And if it isn't something that you're thinking this year, please do keep in mind that we will have this partnership running and the, the Burdett Fellow Scholarship will be sitting with us for a number of years um, and share as widely as you can as well. So I'll hand over to Giovanni and Giovanni can talk through um, some of the specifics around the application and our sort of our, our process. Um, it's sort of a two step process. And if I need to jump in on any other um, added um, points, I'll, I'll do that. But thank you. Thanks, Rachel, and welcome, everybody. So I will just give you information about the application process for um, both the MSCR in nursing and the Verdet. So of course, the first important information to note is that the deadline for both the master's uh, application and the Burdett application is on 22nd of April. And it's important to note that both the application must be submitted online. So both the, the master's application and the Burdett application must be submitted online. Now, the important thing is that in order to submit the Burdett application, you will have to submit your MSCR, your master's application first. That's because when you submit your mm, program application, your master's application, you will create uh, an account through our uh, application portal, which is Euclid. And then from your um, application portal, uh, from your account, you will be able to see the section where you can submit your uh, scholarship application. So without submitting your master's application first, you won't be able to submit your scholarship application. So that's important to note. Anyway, I also uh, I also pasted a few links uh, on in the chat, and I will um, talk you through in a, in a bit. So um, once you submitted both applications, normally what I do, I just I'll go through your documentation. I just check that everything is there. So just please also ensure that you uh, have a look um, regularly, regularly to your email because in case there is any 
uh, document required, anything which is missing, I will contact you and I will let you know. And you'll have time until the deadline to submit uh, you know, all the required documents. And then after that, uh, after the deadline, after the um, application deadline, um, the applications will be sent to the to our academic review panel, which will shortlist uh, the applications and all the shortlisted applications will be called for an interview, which I think we aim to have around the middle of May. And uh, another, another important thing to note is that uh, once you submit your master's application, you're automatically eligible to apply for the Burdette. So once you submit your program application, you don't have to wait for an offer, for example, or for any other communication. Once you submit your master's application, you can straight away apply for the uh, Burdette, which is something I actually suggest because, again, deadline is the same and time is running. So um the sooner the better of course when you submit application so you, we can also ensure that all the documents are supplying uh, are are there so um what i will do i will just paste again uh the links so if you see in the chat i'll paste it a few useful links the first one is just about our um master's program uh, information over there you would find all the information about our program with more useful links for example to our nursing community then the second link is more specific to the Burdette uh, application. So over there you will see all the information about uh, uh, this funding opportunity, uh, the application process, what's required um, from you as an applicant. And then the third, li uh, the, the third link is our uh, apply page. So the link to the application for the master's program. Um, so over there again, you will see other information about the application process and documents required and the actual apply links. So you need to go there first and submit your application. Then again, you will be able to submit your scholarship application. And for that, I also pasted another useful link, which is a step-by-step -step process on how to submit your um, scholarship application, because you won't find any links to the scholarship application on the website. Uh, everything will be on your uh, student account, on your Euclid account. So uh, over there, you will find the section for the scholarship. You can select uh, all the scholarships you are eligible for. In this case, it would be, I think, just the Burdette. And again, if you have any problems, you are, if you are stuck at any point uh, with submitting the application, you can follow this uh, guidance, which is very detailed. So you should be able to submit the application. But of course, if you have any other question, if you have any other doubts, I also uh, pasted our email address. Uh, so our admission email address um, for any doubt, any other questions. Uh, of course, you can ask here today, but you can also ask later on. Uh, just drop us an email. Most likely, it will be me answering, or if I'm not there, will be there will be another member of the team. So just feel free to to drop us any questions, and we will be able to and happy to to assist. So that's more or less the all the application process. So I can hand it over to Aisha. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Giovanni. And some really important information for you in the chat. And someone has asked if we can send these to you. Um, Philip, um, thank you for that. We will share these links with you after this session has finished. And we will also send you the link to the recording of this session so you can listen to it again. And some really great points there from Giovanni. The closing date is the 22nd of April. The fact that you must apply for the MSCR first because that creates an account for you and then you can apply for the Burdett Fellowship, but they both must be submitted before the 22nd deadline. And Rachel has, there are links to all of those, and Rachel has also kindly put in um, the additional criteria for the Burdett Fellows is to submit a brief research proposal and um, I'll say a little bit more about that now because our current, um, after last year, we shortlisted and we interviewed several candidates and the research proposal gave us a real strong indication of the development of the idea or certainly the potential. And what we find is that once the students started, we developed those proposals further. Um, and my advice would be, thinking about last year's application, keep these proposals very simple. Most submissions that came in were very complex studies that probably were more suitable for a PhD. This is a one-year um, master's in research. It's a very short time period. So 
it will be a very focused piece of work, quite discreet, quite manageable in the time scale that we have. So that would be my feedback to you. Think carefully. And if you we would also suggest connecting either with a research unit nearby you or perhaps an academic institution or within your network, anyone who has got research experience to help you with that proposal. Um, we're really keen to hear from people who've given it a bit more thought. So as Rachel said, if it's maybe not this year, then you can use this next year to help prepare um, for the proposal and the application. And then obviously we've got the letters of support from one or two named academics. The reason we do this is that we want you to be supported in country also. And Gertrude will be able to tell you a bit more about how that has really helped her with her um, project. And similarly with um, Izzy here in the UK, but very much so for our international students. This is about you not really being on your own. We want you to have a support network around you, both here in the UK and back in country while you're collecting your data. And then a short personal statement on how it would impact you and your local professional community. And that's about, we do want to see something in there that understands the purpose of the Burdett Trust for Nursing, and you can find there we'll put in the chat also the link to their web page and also about um, how this will develop you and your colleagues and Gertrude will probably say a little bit more about that. This is really about research capacity building and the great thing is we are linked in with our other HEI institutions across the UK and we're hoping that our current fellows will meet each other. Um, I think the key thing just to mention um, is also the Nursing Now Challenge and leadership development. We're very focused alongside your MSCR is that you get development around your personal leadership. And again, Gertrude and Izzy will be able to talk about that because they come and sit in on my class on nursing and global health policy, developing political leadership. They don't have to do the assignment, they just come over the 10 weeks and sit and experience it. And I think that's been a really useful thing for them to get that bigger global perspective. And they've been able to gauge with global leaders, former WHO CNO Elizabeth Iru, and different um, nurses who, and early career nurses who are on, who are ambitious, who are on that career journey that we want to take them. So there is a whole package here. And we encourage our fellows to be part of the Nursing Now Challenge, which is a Burdett funded programme, because that creates that network for you, both now, but moving forward in your career. Um, I think that's all I want to say at the moment. And I think now what we're going to do is listen to a couple of videos from Izzy and Gertrude about their reflections. And these are very powerful stories and I hope you enjoy hearing from them. Can you see my screen? Green with you. Yes. Of my research, what I'm doing back. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Izzy, one of the Bidet Fellows, um, UK based. I thought I'd just chat you through a little bit of my research, what I'm doing, the background to it, and just a bit of my experience as well. Um, so I'm going to try and share my screen with you. I hope that you can see that okay. Um, yeah, so my topic focuses on um, nurses in policy making and the policy arena. And to be honest, it's not really until I started applying for um, the scholarship and putting together my research proposal that I started actually realising the power of policy and the fact that it literally defines everything that we do our day to day as nurses, um, everything from um, where funding goes, where resources go, which illnesses and diseases get more attention and therefore more resources um, and what treatments we can offer patients as well. It kind of, it determines everything. Um, so despite nurses being the biggest group of policy implementers, um, there's actually not that many of us in policy making positions. Um, and this has been referred to by Salvage and White as a crisis of leadership. Um, and I think this really hits home, especially in that second um, statistic as well. Um, in a study actually by Nursing Now, I think, um, 
where it says that even though 70% of the health and social workforce are women and nearly 90% of the nursing and midwifery workforce are women, only 25% are senior managers, um, which is crazy. So you've got yeah nurses as this biggest group of policy implementers, but um, we have the smallest voice around policy tables um, and the smallest voice in these decisions that determine um, so much about um, how we can care for our patients and what we can offer them as nurses. Um, so in terms of the current literature, um, one of the main reasons why nurses aren't that involved in policy making, I found out, um, is a lot to do with nurses identity and how we see ourselves um so for example yeah psychological engagement was most predictive of whether or not um nurses participated politically um and then another study in, in that final bullet point you can see there was a positive correlation between political involvement and self-rated confidence as well to perform political activities um and again, fewer than one half of the 468 nurses in a study thought they could influence even local decisions, let alone global decisions and um, global health decisions. So you've got all this literature that says that we're not that involved in policy making. And then on the other hand, you've got this literature that says nurses don't see themselves um, as a group that could be involved um, in making these big decisions and in policy making and policy development. Um, so that's kind of where my study steps in. Um, so the research question that I've developed is what are nurse leaders experiences of their professional identity and ability to influence policy? Um, so what I really want to kind of tease out in, I'm doing semi-structured interviews, um, and I really want to tease out this connection between um, professional identity and ability to influence policy. So what is it about these nurses that are in these incredible influential positions, really inspirational positions? What is it about how they define themselves and how they view their scope as nurses um, that allows them to engage so successfully and so effectively with policy? Um, and what can we therefore learn from them as people that aren't engaging with policy? Um, and so I think the hope is as well for further research about um, that will have a bit more focus on competencies as well of these nurses. So, again, that we can learn from that and build into um, training and um, yeah, undergraduate programmes and that kind of thing. So it's very, very exciting stuff. Um, in terms of my experience of um, being a Bidet Fellow, um, I found out about um, this incredible opportunity through a friend of mine who was still doing her undergrad um, degree. Um, and when she told me about it, to be honest, I was quite, it, it was one of those moments where I, it was just an opportunity that came along and it was everything that I'd been wanting, really. Um, so I'd graduated and worked for a year um, on a very busy ward, MAU. <laughs> um, and I'd always had this interest in research, but not really known how to channel that and what to do with that. Um, so when she was telling me that it's this um, MRES programme and it's a scholarship base, um, so it's fully funded and... Um, yeah, it was. I just couldn't quite believe my ears, to be honest. Um, and so it sort of started from there. And then I think I got in touch with Aisha. Um, I was filling out the application and um, I got in touch with Aisha um, at the point when I was looking at my research proposal. Um, and she very helpfully sort of steered me in the right direction as well um, in terms of this topic. This is something that she's very passionate about as well. And as I read and learned more about it, I became very passionate about it too. Um, so that was sort of like how I came to reply. Um, and then I think I had to do an interview as well and put together a little presentation of um, my hope for um, my research, which has developed a lot since I gave that presentation. So it does look quite different now. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a yeah, great experience doing the interview. It was just very um, relaxed and informal um, and I was able to convey what I was hoping to look at. Um, and then since then, really, there's been so many opportunities since starting. Um, I feel like even, even in the teaching that I've had, it's not only been such a great foundation of um, research theory, um, 
but also the teaching that we've had on um, leadership within nursing and even actually this past semester doing a um, a course on policy and leadership, which is very helpful for me for my topic anyway. But um, we've had some incredible speakers that have come and spoken to us and um, just people that are doing some really inspiring things um, in nursing, including Elizabeth Iro, actually, who was the first CNO at WHO. Um, and I think, to be honest, it's just completely opened my eyes to... Um, yeah a different definition of nursing that's not um only focused on the ward and the patients right in front of you um as important as that is but um it's really taken me out and given me this broader perspective of what nursing is and the opportunities and um yeah the opportunity to have this wider impact i think and look at nursing from a wider lens um and we've got a trip actually to WHO coming up as well, which is amazing and not something that I would ever have been able to do by myself. Or um, I think this course, it really just gives you the the contacts as well and the networking um, and therefore the opportunities. Because I think a lot of the time things end up happening through knowing the right people and speaking to the right people. Um, so, yeah, it's been amazing. And I've, I've noticed a lot of personal growth as well. I think I've become a lot more confident in um public speaking and being able to convey um my project even and um yeah networking as well I think it just it kind of it gives you the theory and it gives you the experience but it it sets you on a, a path of personal development and growth as well so but anyone that's um got a lot of passion for to do something in nursing and they're not quite sure where to channel it to be honest, this is a great opportunity because I think it, it points you in the right direction and it gives you everything you need to go after what you want as well. So, yeah, I hope that's um, been helpful. I'm very happy to um, be asked any questions or get in touch if, um, yeah, if you want further information on anything. Um, but yeah, take care. That was lovely. While we're just getting ready with Gertrude's um, video, um, thank you, Izzy. I'm not sure she's been able to join us, but um, a wonderful kind of account of um, how that journey is. Oh, there is Izzy. Hello. Sorry, it's <laughs> taking me so long to join. <laughs> oh, hi, everyone. Oh. I'm happy to answer any questions or anything. Okay, Izzy, I think we're going to wait till the end, but it's so lovely to see you in person and what a fantastic, absolutely wonderful video um, and just so lovely listening to it and knowing that the journey that you've been on and continues is um, just such a wonderful one. I'm so privileged to be part of it. So um, we'll wait till the end and we're going to listen to Gertrude now. My name is Gertrude Bamba. I'm a budget fellow based here at the University of Edinburgh in the United Kingdom, Scotland to be specific. So my master's, uh, I'm looking at uh, task shifting in the middle of workforce. So just to give you a background of what I'm working on. So the WHO uh, recommended uh, task shifting. So because of the shortage of human resources for health and specifically midwives that I'm looking at, uh, task shifting was recommended as a strategy to avert uh, the human resources uh, for health crisis and so that it can necessitate universal coverage of health, uh, of health services. Um, so most governments, in terms of trying to avert the human resources crisis, they responded that they had a number of policies where they were, which would that would help them uh, to avert the crisis. And going by the WHO recommendations, so there are about three policies that most government used in educating midwives to professional levels. Um, and then after education, making sure they are appropriately recruited and also um, appropriate task shifting. So my focus on on, on research is this the appropriate task shift. I'm looking at that uh, at task task shifting. 
So task shifting in brief involves a substitution and delegation of tasks uh, within the members of the workforce that are already existing or sometimes they create a new cadre where these other tasks are taken from the professional um, members of the workforce and given to this low or less skilled uh, cadre of um, within a profession and sometimes it involves delegating to non-professionals where tasks are taken sometimes this for example from the midwives given to tradition traditional birth attendants or sometimes from midwife given to community health workers um so that's just an example so the focus of my research is that uh, i'm looking at a, a task shifting the experiences of midwife with the task shifting uh, strategy so the my aim what i'm trying to get out is that uh, look at what ha, what uh, what effects apart from making midwifery services available to everyone what other effects uh, has has task shifting brought into the midwifery workforce so i'm looking at experiences of midwives with task shifting um trying to find out or explore what effect task shifting has had on the workforce, also looking at effect on the uh, on the midwives themselves, the effect of task shifting on the midwife. I also be looking at the effect on maternity care in general, how has task shifting affected the care that midwives uh, give to uh, to people or women or families that need uh, that need the services. So but that fellowship how did I become a budget fellow? So I saw the uh, uh, the call for applications in for the budget fellowship under the University of Edinburgh, but I accessed the Advent and Global Research Nurses Network website. That's where I saw the call. So what I did after I saw the call, I immediately went and viewed the school website to see what the requirements are and see if I am meeting the school's requirement to get admission into the master's uh, by research in nursing studies. And then I immediately started working on a research concept because it is part of the submission. And then I went on the school website, I applied for my admission into the master's and provided all the witness that they wanted and also applied for the fellowship on this on, on that same on that same website. When you face up with the fellowship, the school might ask you to contact uh, uh, a supervisor uh, which you you may be you may be guided or you can go on the website and ch choose a supervisor who you think is related to a topic that you're, you'll be trying to look at i unfortunately uh, i passed the, the, my, my submission passed the first review and then a, a feature interview was organized which i did attend uh while i was still in my in by the way i come from malawi so i was attending the interview while i was still back home so what does it mean to me being a budget fellow? It has budget fellow, this fellowship has opened a new world of marginal possibilities. I feel like I I'm 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 very capable, nice leader, uh, I can do um I can do many things uh, with this qualification as as uh, being in meetings, high level meetings that we've never thought about uh being in and also changed uh, my world the world view my own view of, of nursing and military profession through the political lens, understanding that nursing operates in a political area. We need to make ourselves heard, make, make ourselves known, present ourselves, and also make sure that where the, these decisions are made, we're also sitting in there to make decisions that we might impact um, uh, our profession. I've, it has uh, exposed me to advanced leadership mentorship, very uh, world-class nurses providing leadership mentorship, which is very beneficial in terms of when I get out or just uh, uh, learning on how you can uh, take yourself through uh, nurse poli in, in, in policy, in formulating policy or affecting, affecting policy. So there's an excellent academic and social support here at the University of Edinburgh. It's a home where a lot of networking, you meet people, it's, it's a community of people from all over. Excellent research that is happening here at the University of Edinburgh in the nursing studies department. One thing that has really taught me is help, the fellowship is helping me find my purpose. My purpose as a nurse, 
it's not it's no longer now about me it's about what i can do for the community and the people that i work for what i can do for my profession time to raise the standards of the nursing profession so i will I'd like to wish you all the best. Um, those that are contemplating and applying, please go ahead. Uh, wishing to meet you uh, in September. And by the way, I am from Malawi in Southern Africa. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, I hope you really enjoyed listening to Gertrude's story also. And her final parting message about finding her purpose and while she's been having this wonderful opportunity and that's about our focus on our profession and generosity to others and that is such a fulfilling um, thing to do and will help your personal and professional development. So I think what we're going to do is if we could maybe have Izzy and Gertrude on the Green. I think Hannah, am I correct in thinking we are going to a bit of Q&A? You message just went to host some panels. Oh, sorry, Rachel Bruce, <laughs> thank you, Rachel. <laughs> I'm just keeping an eye on that chat. Um, yes, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Hannah, we're going to give Izzy and Gertrude a chance to um, take any questions. Um, and if not, then I've got a few for them anyway. Yeah, that's right. We've got about 15 minutes or so, so we're good to do some Q&As, yeah. Okay, super. So please, if anyone has um, any questions um, for Izzy and Gertrude, now is your chance because they've actually gone through the process that you've gone through and were successful and um, are living the dream, shall I say, <laughs> of... Um, transformation um, and I was speaking to them the other week saying that now they've got they look very relieved and happy at the beginning I think it was quite a daunting task coming and I'm sure you may think that being um, unsure about what the future holds is this the right thing for you to do how will you be supported will it all work out okay and um, I think both Izzy and Gertrude have benefited from a lot of the things we've talked about, Larry, Giovanni, Rachel, there's a whole team here supporting everybody. And um, uh, I think that's part of the, the lovely thing about um, what we have to offer here. So I think there is a question in the chat. I can't actually see it. Sorry, I think it's from Zipporah. Zippy has a question, but I can't see it for some uh, reason. Yeah, Aisha, Zipporah says, any tips to make applications stand out? Any tips? Okay, to make the application stand out. Um, well, I think what is really nice to see is that someone has taken some time over the application and understands what it is we are asking for. And there are two components to this. There's the application for the MRAs which is a much more um, standardized application that you would see if you were applying for any um, degree program. And what's useful to see there is that there is a thoughtfulness in why you're applying, that you provide the references, et cetera. I think Giovanni might be able to speak better to that. So I'll let him do that in a minute and I'll maybe focus perhaps on the Burdett element, which is really said a little bit about that, where about why you've applied for this and giving that quite a bit of thought. And I know both Izzy and Gertrude's application were really focused on the purpose of the nurse of um, Burdett Trust and what it was trying to do and how they saw research as being the component of their future work and their experience with that and what they felt it would bring them and their community. And I think what's useful is to use those around you to share your application with, get feedback on it. And it's something I do all the time um, just because I'm a professor at Emory University. Um, I, I don't think I know how to write everything. In fact, it's the complete opposite. I look for more feedback from people um, about it. So I, I would say that and um, have some thought about this research proposal that you're sending us 
it doesn't have to be the finished version, but it is helpful if it looks like you have some idea about what a research proposal looks like, that there is a, a start, there's an evidence base that you're drawing on that identifies a problem and a process by which you can undertake data collection to answer the research question. And we are available to provide some um, feedback, as has been said, um, she got in touch with me and um, because it's an area of particular interest of mine, I was not on the selection panel um, because Izzy and I had had a couple of conversations about her application and it wouldn't have been appropriate for me to do that. Um, so I think that would be my suggestion. I'm going to just hand over to Giovanni around the application process because I think that's really useful in terms of the MRAs as well. Giovanni, are you able to say something about that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Aisha. So in terms of the application process, there are a few documents that you have to submit in order um, for your application to be considered. So of course, uh, you need to submit an um, honours degree, which has to be um, 2-1 UK honours degree or international equivalent. And on our website, there is also uh, pages which can help you uh, to check out if your um, degree, international degree, it's equivalent to our uh, UK uh, 2-1. Then important is a research proposal, which has to be on our template. So there is a specific, uh, specific template that has to be used to submit the research proposal. And you can find it on our website. There is uh, all the information over there and you can download, it's a Word file, you can download and just basically you need to prepare your um, proposal using that template and then submit it because otherwise your application won't be considered. So um, just please ensure that you are using that research proposal form. That's that's very, very important. Then uh, there are two, two reference letters uh, to be submitted with your application. Uh, so normally when you submit your application, um, you um, the system is asking you for the name and contact details of your referees. So the system normally automatically uh, sends the referees an email uh, with a link and they can use that link to submit the, uh, the sorry, the reference letters. Otherwise, uh, the letters can be also uploaded by yourself. So if you ask your referees to send you the letters, you can uh, upload them to the system. Just ensure that uh, these uh, referees are not older than six months, uh, written on headed paper and also signed by your referees. And um, then, of course, uh, if you contact the potential supervisor first uh, to I mean, prior to apply, that's also good to have feedback that's, uh, that could increase your chance of being ex accepted, as also uh, Aisha mentioned before. And then uh, important is also an English language qualification, which is not required at the time you submit the application. So if you don't have at the moment any English qualification, uh, you can also submit it later on uh, after you submit uh, after you receive an offer. So if your application is successful, you will receive in this case an offer which is conditional on the English language. But in that case, you are you will be required to submit also the English language qualification. Again, you will be able to see all the information uh, on that on our website on the links uh, we will send you later on. So in terms of requirements, mm, that's pretty much it and. Uh, uh, from my side, as long as you have all those documents are submitted, the application is fine to be progressed to the academic review panel. Lovely, Giovanni. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just trying to put some um, things in the chat for people. Um, what I would say for those of, for everyone on the chat today. Um, there is a link to the Nursing Now Challenge. This webinar is not about the Nursing Now Challenge, but the Nursing Now Challenge does link in with our fellows and it's a programmer for debt. So if you want any further information about that, the link is there and the contact details to contact us via Nursing Now Challenge are there. Um, so I'm just going to open the floor to Izzy and Gertrude. Um, and I just want to have a little bit more of a chat with them. Um, and please um, keep your questions coming, unless I've missed any other questions that um, are in the chat there. But um, if you and Gertrude, um, if, I don't know if you, um, Gertrude, if you're um, 
the video is working. Let's see on the on the viewer. I'm going to go to gallery. Let me see. Let's see you. Not quite see you. Anyway, um, so Izzy and Gertrude, um, the stage they're at in their um journey is they came in September and they took a research course in September and then had supervision sessions with me. The first probably two months, maybe we had supervision sessions together because it was very good. They were both in the same boat and um, were a bit lost at sea. So it helped their, I think, friendship, which is a wonderful friendship now, Luke. They are very good friends. Um, and well, we're all good friends, actually. Um, and it was wonderful just to help them find their feet a little bit. And for both of them, it really was around those first six to eight weeks, really taking this idea that they had, both of them, and really developing it a lot through discussion, through further reading, through thinking. And this is all about developing your critical thinking. You can't come up with a research idea overnight. It requires thought, it requires contemplation and discussion with others. And I hopefully helped them navigate that bit of the journey. And that's a little bit of giving enough support whilst leaving enough room of uncertainty so that they are actually developing their skill set themselves rather than I'm providing all the answers as the supervisor. And um, I have, as many of our colleagues have 30 years of supervision experience. So I kind of think I'm, I'm kind of not too bad at um, helping that process. And there were many times they sat in the office <laughs> thinking, we don't know what we're doing. And I said, that's fine. It's okay. You can, that's part of it. I like the fact you don't know what you're doing at the minute because you're thinking about the whole thing and how you can really hone down into something that is a, is a research question that you can get the answer to. And they were able to do that. And I'm going to ask them about that experience in a minute. And then the next thing was the ethics application process which is a big learning curve um, and um, requires a lot of thought because really for the ethics application to go in, you really have to have your study design all really set, set and sorted. And um, your information leaflet, your consent form, understanding data management, et cetera. And there's many resources here that support that process. Um, Izzy had to put in ethics to the university, but also we have another process whereby um, we are ensuring indemnity for research as well. So there's another side to it. Gertrude does another layer. She had to apply for ethics in country also. So that was a huge um, piece of work for her too. And they're currently writing their literature reviews at the minute as they embark on their data collection. So they have done a huge amount of work in the time scale so far. It's very fast paced. You work hard. And this session, they've been doing other research courses that build on and then sitting in on my session. Izzy mentioned that we're heading to the WHO. Um, that won't happen every year. It just so happens we've got the opportunity to go this year in June. They will be coming with a small delegation from the University of Edinburgh. So um, that's kind of where they're at at the minute. We've got about five minutes left. I'm just going to leave Izzy and Gertrude to come in now and just say a little bit more about where they, what they think about where they are now to where they began, um, and maybe any advice they've got, last minute tips for people. So, Izzy, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, I think something that Aisha has kept saying throughout this process is becoming more comfortable with being uncomfortable, and I think that really sums up um, the whole experience, really, because I think for me as well, me and Gertrude came at both from like very different places. So I had no like research experience. Um, so for me, it's been a like very steep learning curve. Um, but I think with that, it's been so helpful having Gertrude because not only like when we had the supervision sessions together, but we've been for coffees and walks and things like that. And we've had the opportunity to just chat generally, but also about each other's projects. Um, and I've really benefited from her experience as well. Um, so I think it is it's definitely cool that you sort of come in twos because you really do benefit from each other's experience. Um, and even be, being able to like vocalize ideas and bounce it around. And um, it's it's been very helpful for me to, to have that. Um, 
but yeah in terms of like the growth I think I think I probably just have become more comfortable with like not knowing exactly what it's going to look like like even writing my literature review now I'm normally someone that has everything structured out before I even start writing but I think I've realized you just start and just let the ideas kind of flow as you do it and it will just fall into place um so I think yeah I've sort of learned to be a little bit hold those things a bit a little bit more loosely um and just sort of let it happen but I think even with the supervision sessions as well it's been quite helpful um not having with I should not being super prescriptive about everything because then it does let that creativity flow as well a bit as opposed to having everything so sort of regimented um so yeah I think it's been it's been a very steep learning curve but um a lot of growth comes with that I think so I've I've really benefited from it and yeah it's been great having Gertrude like we've we've become pals which is a, a huge plus so yeah lovely thank you Izzy Gertrude you just got two minutes um just for your reflection maybe she's still here maybe she's not maybe Gertrude's having some I think she said her okay. connect been a bit dodgy throughout so okay. um because really bad okay don't worry Gertrude that's fine we can we can leave it there um and uh, I think hopefully we've given you some insight to the team here at Edinburgh who will be supporting you um, if you are become one of the fellows either this year or in future years and um, some insight into the application process, the kind of things we're looking for and what's been most useful is really hearing from Izzy and Gertrude who are our first fellows and uh, this hopefully will be a network that grows and they will be available to offer advice and support to other people coming through and that the legacy of the Burdett Fellows will continue. And I think that's really what Shirley Bain, who's the chief exec and the board, that's really, that was the vision, that there would be a legacy of research capacity building and nurse leaders who lead their own research. And we already know that nurses it's the art and the science and we see the whole person and the whole family and the whole community and we see something very different to other professionals so we are able to gain some real insight into some of the key questions that need to be answered that can feed into growing the evidence base and influencing global policy hopefully. Um, the recording is going to be available. It will be available at the end with the links that we've mentioned. And if you have any questions, there is an email address. And through the Nursing Now Challenge you can, on the website, you can get in touch with us. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time. It's been a wonderful hour. Thank you to Rachel, to Larry, to Giovanni, to Hannah behind the scenes, and the team, and Izzy, and Gertrude, and mostly for you for taking the time to join us today. And Faye, also our newest member of the Nursing Challenge team. Good luck, everyone. Um, we hope to see your applications. And um, Nala, lovely to meet you from Sudan. I'm half Sudanese, so um, a, a little special link there. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day, and uh, we hope to see your applications coming in. Thank you.